Hello friends, welcome to this video. I am Karnesh Chauri and today I am going to talk about System 5 semaphores in Linux. System 5 semaphores are traditional semaphores that were introduced in Unix System 5, release 1 in January 1983. Since then, System 5 semaphores have been present in all Unix and Unix-like systems. But first, a quick recap of underlying concepts. What is a semaphore? The word semaphore comes from the Greek word sema, which means a sign or a signal. Semaphore means a system for conveying information using visual signals. Examples are flag positions, railroad signals, traffic signals, etc. The invention of using semaphores in computer software systems was done by the great Dutch computer scientist Edsker W. Dijkstra in 1960s. Semaphores in computer software systems are used for synchronizing concurrent processes and threads. The question comes, why do concurrent processes and threads need to be synchronized? And the answer is, software systems are often designed as a group of cooperating processes and threads. These processes and threads work together to achieve common objectives. In doing so, they face following problems. 1. The process and threads share data. However, only one can modify or access data at a time. Otherwise, the common data might get corrupted. 2. A process might need to signal a peer that it has reached a certain state and the peer might take action accordingly. Continuing with the definition of semaphores, we say semaphore is an integer object. It is an object which has a value of type integer. Its value is non-negative. It can only be zero or positive. Semaphores are provided by the kernel because semaphores have a system-wide scope. A semaphore is visible to all processes and a process can operate on it provided it has the permission to do so. There are two types of semaphores, binary semaphores, a binary semaphore can have value 0 or 1. Counting semaphores, for counting semaphores the value can be greater than or equal to 0. That is a counting semaphore can have value 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 etc. There are two operations that are defined for semaphores. The first operation is P which decrements the semaphore. If semaphore is 0, P blocks till the time semaphore becomes non-zero and it can be decremented. The second operation is V. This increments the semaphore by 1. It is important to realize that neither P nor V can be coded as C functions in user space because the kernel can interrupt the process anytime. One process can find SAM is 1 and decide to decrement it before it can decrement the process loses a CPU and next process again finds it 1 so goes ahead and decrements it. So it won't work. Both P and V must be atomic operations that is the kernel does not interrupt the processing of P or V operation. So semaphores and operations on these semaphores need to be provided by the kernel. There are two types of semaphores. System 5 semaphores and POSIX semaphores. In this video, I will be talking only on System 5 semaphores. Now, System 5 semaphore calls are complicated and that is an understatement. So, our approach is to understand the System 5 semaphore calls as they are but use them in a way that simplifies programming. We will try to program P and V operations using the System 5 semaphore calls and then use P and V operators in our programs. For creating a system 5 semaphore, we first need a system 5 IPC key. We can create a system 5 IPC key with the FTOK function. The first parameter is a file name. This file must be existing and be accessible. The contents of the file are immaterial. The second parameter is an integer project ID. Only the last 8 bits are used and these must not be zero. So if you pass a value between 1 and 255, you are well off. FTO returns a system 5 IPC key. SEMGET gets a set of semaphores associated with the first argument key. 
It is notable that you get not one but a set of semaphores with semget. The key can be obtained using the FTOK function or you could pass the IPC private constant as the first parameter and a new set of semaphores are created. Also if you pass key obtained from FTOK function and specify IPC create in semflag a new set of semaphores are created and the semaphore set ID is returned. If the last argument has both IPC create and IPC EXCL and semaphore set already exists for the key, semget fails with error number set to E exist. If a new semaphore set is created, the least 9 significant bits semflag specify the permissions for the semaphore set. The second argument and sem specifies the number of semaphores in the set. It should be greater than 0 and less than or equal to sem msl, the maximum number of semaphores per semaphore set. You can find this value using the ipcs minus ls command if you are not creating the semaphore set and expect it to exist when you make the sem get call, you can pass n sems as 0. The sem ctl system call is for semaphore operations. The first parameter sem id is a semaphore set id. The second parameter sem num identifies the semaphore number in the set. Semaphore are numbered in a set starting with 0. The third parameter is the command identifying the semaphore control operation. The commands are IPC stat for getting status of semaphore set. IPC set for setting some fields of the kernel data structure associated with the semaphore set. Set well, setting the value of semaphore in a set. Set all, setting the values of all semaphores in the set. Get well, getting the value of a semaphore in the set. And get all, getting the values of all semaphores in the set. IPC RMID. Remove the semaphore set. SEMCTL has an optional fourth parameter. The fourth parameter is there for some commands. If present, the fourth parameter is of type union sem un. The union sem un has four members. Since it is a union, it will have any one of them at a time. The integer well is used for passing values for the sem well command. Similarly, the third member array is used for passing values for all the semaphores in the set. The second member of the union is buff which points to struct semiddS. Now semiddS has four members. The first member is the struct semprm which has ownership and permissions data. The second member is semo time, the time of last semop and the third member is semc time which is the last change time. The last and the fourth member is sem n sems, which gives the number of semaphores in the set. And if you look at the struct IPC PERM, it has the key, UID and GID of owner and creator, and it has an unsigned short integer mode. The least significant 9 bits of mode have the permissions. The most common use of sem CTL is to initialize a semaphore. The system called semget does not initialize the semaphore. So after semget you call semctl to initialize semaphore to some value, maybe one if it's, an, if it's a binary semaphore or some other value reflecting the quantity for resource for counting semaphores. The semop call is for system 5 semaphore operations. We can implement PNV operators using the semop call. In semop, the first parameter is the sem id which identifies the semaphore set. The second parameter sops is an array of struct sem buff. Each element of the array's sops is a semaphore operation to be done on one more or all of the semaphores in the semaphore set. The number of elements in the array sops is given in the last parameter n sops. All the operations on the semaphores are done atomically. That is once the call returns, either all the work is done or nothing is done. Looking at the struct sem buff, the first member is sem num which is the num semaphore number in the set. Semaphores are numbered 0 onwards in the set. Next is the short integer semop. Semop can be negative, 0 or positive. Negative semop means a decrement operation and semop of minus 1 means the p operation. Similarly, a positive semop means increment and semop of plus 1 means the v operation. 
sum of, of 0 means await till the sum of a value is 0. Now we come to the last member of the struct as buff which is sum flag. If sum flag is IPC no wet set the sum of does not block. If a sum of our operation would normally require blocking but if IPC no wet has been set the call returns immediately with nothing done and error number is set to E again. There is another flag sum undo. If sum undo is specified sum of our operation is undone when the process terminates. The kernel keeps an adjustment value for each process that does a sum up on the sum of 4. For each sum up, the sum up value is subtracted from the adjustment value. When the process terminates, the adjustment value is added to the sum of 4 value. Then there is a sum time up call which is sum up call with a timeout. The timeout is specified as the fourth parameter to the call. If the corresponding sum up operation would block in a situation, same time of call would block too, but only till the timeout. When timeout occurs, same time of call returns without doing any change to the sum of values and setting the error number as E again. If timeout is null, same time of behaves just like the sum of call. Are system 5 sum of calls complex? Some people think they are. So how do we write our programs using system 5 semaphores? To manage complexity, we use certain guidelines in using semaphores. First, no multiple semaphores in a set, only one semaphore per set. So semaphore, semaphore set virtually mean the same thing. Second, no arbitrary decrement or increment in semop. Implement P and V operators using semop. The program algorithm should only talk about using P and V operators. And this is the approach we'll use in our example program. As an example, we'll look at the producer-consumer problem. There are 10 buffers to be used by producers to pass data to consumer. There are 10 producer threads who produce strings of text. A producer acquires one buffer out of 10, produces a string and writes it into the acquired buffer. So if no buffers are available, a producer wishing to produce a string must block. The consumer is a spooler thread which comes into action whenever there is a string produced by a producer. The spooler picks up the string, prints it on the screen. The spooler must come into action only when there is a string to be printed. Otherwise, it can just relax. And multiple producers must not write on the same buffer. There are three semaphores that help us to do all this. Mutex semaphore with an initial value 1. Buffer count semaphore with an initial value 10. And a spool signal semaphore with an initial value 0. This is the example program. There are three files. These are temporary files used for, get, for getting the IPC key by system 5 IPC key. Then there are 10 buffers and this buffer index which gives the next empty buffer which can be used by a producer and there is a buffer print index which is used by the spooler. There are three semaphores mutex sem, buffer count sem, spool signal sem. So we come to the main function. We initialize the buffer index and buffer print index and we create the semaphores. We do a sem get for mutex sem and it is initialized to 1. The value of semaphore is initialized to 1. Then we get the then we do a sem get for buffer count sem and we initialize it to max buffers 10. Then there is a spool signal sem. We do a sem get for a spool signal sem. We initialize it to 0. We create the spooler and we create 10 producer threads. Okay, and then we go to the then, then, then let's look at the let's look at the producer. This is the producer function which is executed by 10 producer threads. Each producer thread creates 10 strings. So we get about 100 strings. Now what it does, uh, first thing it tries to get a buffer. It does a P on buffer count sum. So if the buffers are available, this P is successful. Suppose no buffers were available, this P would block here. But let's, let's assume P is successful, then it comes down. It does a P on mutex sum. Because, because only one producer can access the buffer index 
uh, we put it under inside the mutex cell and once this P is successful that means only one producer can execute this uh, part of the code at a time so we get, it gets the buffer index and it saves the buffer index in the variable j increments the buffer index and if buffer index becomes equal to 10 it initializes to 0 having got the buffer it releases the buffer mutex sam it does a v on mutex sam and then it makes a string it writes the string in the buffer buff j and then it does a v on spool signal sam it does a v on spool signal sam so that the spooler comes to know there is something to print the spooler is stuck on spool signal sam because initially it was zero now since a producer has done a v on spool signal sam this p is successful it goes it gets past this point and uh, it takes the in, it takes the string from the buffer based on buffer print index and uh, since there is only one spooler only, which is using buffer print index we don't put it under the uh, mutex sam we just use it just like that and it after it uh, prints it it increments it by one and if buffer print index is equal to max buffer it makes it zero it points it to the first buffer now it it has uh, used it has used one of the one of the buff buffers it has made it uh, it has printed from one of the buffers now this buffer can be put back for use by the producers so spooler does a v on buffer count sam so this is how the buffer gets released we can compile and run this program gcc semaphore example dot c minus lp thread minus o semaphore example create the temporary files for ipc key greater than slash temps slash sam mutex key greater than slash temps slash sam buffer count key greater than slash temps slash sam spool signal key and we can run the program dot slash semaphore example with this we have come to the end of this video you can get all this information at http colon double slash bit dot ly slash system v hyphen semaphores thanks very much for watching have a good day